I'm Jeff Lippman. I'm the moderator for this session. I can think of nothing that would please you more after having a panel on sponsorship with probably the best guys in the business in the world at the end of a long day to have a bureaucrat and two technocrats talk to you about safety, security, and health. You must be a fascinated audience out there. Um, but the reality is, whilst every session from the opening panel has been talking about the enormous amount of promotion and international focus that goes on around great events and, and great city hosting of great events, the reality is there's something at the exact opposite end of the spectrum which, if it isn't right, can absolutely destroy those events overnight. And in a way, it's a subject that's central to the bidding and the success of any major event, and yet it's most effective when it's taken as a given and it doesn't feature in the media at all. And there's two examples I want to give. You're going to hear a lot of examples from our panel. But think about the Munich Olympics. What do you think about? Security, disaster, and, and horror. You don't think about the Olympic Games and what went into all of that. And on the other end, and I think we're going to have a healthy debate on this, you have the South African Soccer World Cup, which cast aside this potential um, safety, security, and health fear that pervaded the media for months before the event, and which actually was an immense nation branding and public relations and image success. So you have this huge contrast. And even listening to the whole discussion today, which has been an excellent day, I've left with one missing element. We're having this discussion almost in a, in a static dynamic, if you can use that word, a static dynamic. We know that over the next 10 years, when bids that are made today are going to become implemented, all you can read about is immense and change of a kind that we have not seen before. And I was struck as I came into Dubai last night by one of the factoids that Visa was putting up there. And it said that in 1991, there was only one high-rise building in Dubai. And that today, 15 years almost later, there's close to a thousand. What are the great cities going to be like over the next decade where we know the pace of change is accelerating and all of those dynamic, geopolitical, climate, sociological changes are going to come into effect? How do you plan an event over that kind of a change on something as fundamental as safety, security, and health. And thank you, Chair, for disrupting my flow. And um, we have here a panel, white Anglo-Saxon male panel, I have to tell you, which is short on quantity but I think long on quality to discuss this with you. And we're going to do something that has not been done by the incredibly good previous panel. We're going to make our presentations in seven minutes each, and I'm going to be tough on that. And then we're going to open it straight up to the floor to have a discussion with you. Otherwise, we fear that you're going to go to sleep. And Tim Roberts is going to make the first presentation. He's director of the event safety shop. He has 25 years of experience in this field, including, I shudder to say, working with the Rolling Stones and Madonna. 
he's going to set the framework in terms of planning, execution and legacy on these issues. And he's going to be followed by Heinz Palme, who is the Director of Business Development for the International Center for Sports Security. And Heinz's experience is in sports management and event delivery, mostly around international football, with a great focus on security issues. So, without any further ado, I'd like to ask Tim Roberts if he'd make his seven-minute presentation. Seven, seven, must be seven minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to address you. There's nothing quicker than at clearing a room than a presentation on health and safety. Um, in support of myself and in uh, something of a break from what we've had to date, I'm going to show you some pictures because I think pictures do genuinely uh, cover a thousand words. Um, just to follow on from the introduction that uh, Jeffrey had given me, uh, I'm director of a company called the Event Safety Shop and we provide uh, a specialist health and safety and uh, production consultancy to the global event business. Uh, our primary products really are festivals, concerts, tours, but we also do um, sporting events, uh, large-scale cultural activities of all sorts, um, but always focused on the health and safety aspect. So I, I wanted to start off by um, lightening the mood just a little. I mean, it's a serious subject, but heck, I like a laugh as well. So I, I just want to ask this question. Is my advanced light working? Could you advance the slide, please, Mr. Technician? Ah, fabulous. Okay, what is health and safety? Uh, the general and the common perception of health and safety is exemplified by this picture of one of my clients at one of our uh, blue chip events. We were opening the St. Pancras International Station for, uh, with Her Majesty the Queen uh, back in the UK a few years back. Uh, and the level of health and safety that was imposed on us meant that we really needed to wear three hard hats each. It was sometimes perceived as a whole series of silly rules that got in the way of good and sensible production. It was the imposition of unnecessary hurdles, paperwork, logistical nightmare to get stuff done. Now, my presentation to you this afternoon is really to try and challenge those opinions if that's your perception of health and safety and health and safety management. Can we move to the next one? I knew I needed a button. Um, to my mind, in the production business, health and safety is primarily about establishing a safe way of working, a safe and sensible way to physically build the infrastructure that you're going to use, uh, and a way of protecting both your staff, uh, your contractors, and the public who are going to finally come in and engage in that space. Um, hands up here, I can't see you, but nod if you wish to. Who heard about the crane collapse in Sao Paulo that fell onto the, um, the World Cup stadium during the build? Okay, a smattering of them. Did anybody hear about a crane collapse that happened the week before? Or the month before? Or last year's stats for crane collapses? No. The reason you know about the crane collapse in Sao Paulo is because when you are putting on a mega scale event, you have global focus. And incidents and accidents relating to that have a global impact. So anyone wishing to engage with events needs to be very aware that failures in their safety management techniques and the, uh, in, in their planning and production uh, execution can actually draw in global media attention that otherwise would be completely unwarranted. So what we can see here, uh, oh, you've advanced, fantastic. Um, the previous example was uh, the U2 stage being built. And I just draw your attention now um, to the gentleman in the middle. If you could just advance the slide again for me, please. There we go, if you hadn't spotted him already, walking, free walking across uh, uh, probably a 300 millimeter wide beam, um, 12 or 15 meters in the air. That's the kind of thing that is going to draw down, uh, you know, global scrutiny um, and very bad press and publicity should something go wrong. It also means that the guy there is likely to die, but you can see he's not completely stupid because in the corner there he's not going to walk the beam until the ambulance is already in the venue. But this is the kind of endemic risk-taking culture that needs to be challenged on mega-scale events. This is the kind of thing that we need to engage with our contractors, our suppliers, and set acceptable standards of behavior and acceptable standards of safety throughout the production process. Can we have the next one, please? 
Large-scale events, whatever the context or whatever the content, genuinely require uh, a joint approach to planning for public safety. And that joint approach means the organizer, the, the, the sponsors, the brand partners, um, but critically buy-in from the police, the enforcing authorities, the authorities having jurisdiction, local government and national government, to set an agenda for health and safety, to set an agenda to protect the staff, to set an agenda to protect the public who come to the event, and to have genuinely integrated plans for doing stuff and responding effectively should things go wrong. Forgive me, the next couple of slides may not be pleasant. If you could pop forward, please. This is an example of what can happen when it goes wrong. This is uh, an event called the Love Parade uh, in Duisburg in 2010 in Germany. Approximately one and a quarter million people, one and a quarter million people attended this free event in Duisburg. Uh, and this is what happens when you don't properly plan your crowd dynamics. You don't carry out a thorough risk assessment of how folks are going to get in and out. They had one entrance that was the same as the exit. You're looking at the picture there. 21 of the people in that photograph died. And forevermore, Duisburg and the words Love Parade will be associated with death and mayhem because there wasn't proper integration with the city authorities, there wasn't proper scrutiny, there wasn't objective analysis of whether the event was a good idea. Everybody wanted it, they wanted the branding, they wanted the sponsorship, they wanted the uh, regional and cultural you know, uh, jewel of having the love parade uh, in, their, in their local city, um, and it ended in, in disaster. Next up. We need some genuine emergency preparedness. Every event, whether mega scale or micro scale, even in this room this afternoon, we have emergency preparedness to deal with the unexpected. And as we saw at the Boston Marathon last year, or in this year, um, the unexpected can strike anywhere. Sporting events, cultural events, festivals, concerts, shopping centers. Look at what happened at Westgate Center in Kenya. Any place where there is a mass assemblage of people is now a potential target. And anyone who is running a shopping center, a theater, a cinema, a sporting event, really, really, really need to have a plan for emergency preparedness. Um, if you could just advance again, please. This is a hideous photo, and I apologize for showing it to you, but if there's one thing you remember this afternoon, remember this. This is the stage at the Indiana State Fair falling over in 2011. Seven dead, 42 seriously injured. Two of the people who died were follow spot operators in the roof of this stage, so they were up there preparing for the gig. And the stage fell into the crowd. Disastrous, catastrophic. The reason it fell over was that the wind was too strong for the stage. But that's a different set of questions to why did the stage fall over and kill people? That was a lack of emergency preparedness. That was paralysis and inability to make decisions in the face of the threat of impending serious weather. And I would beg you, at each of your events, please think ahead. Your planning needs to include considerations of what will we do should the unexpected happen? What would we, what would we do should there be an active shooter in the venue? What will we do if a hurricane or tornado, an unusual weather event is predicted? What will we do if? That is emergency preparedness, and that requires buy-in from the state, from the local police, from your organizers, from your contractors, from your technical suppliers, and so on. Good event planning is about risk management. And here's a great example. Uh, this is the uh, Red Bull X fighters that we did in, uh, in London a few years back. Good event planning is not about removing all risk. It's not about making the thing sanitized and you know, completely safe. It's like a circus. Who wants to go to a circus where there is no risk? The challenge is to make your event look dynamic, interesting, new, invigorating, like the X-Fighters. This is crazy nonsense, and that's why people go. They want crazy nonsense. They are craving the dynamism and the adrenaline of a new and dynamic event. The challenge for people like myself and organizers of these kind of gigs is to make sure that that frisson of excitement and energy and passion is retained, but actually there's no genuine risk or danger to participants or members of the public who come to see it. This next slide is a great example. Uh, this is uh, Glastonbury Festival, and I'm very proud, proud to say that uh, you know, they're a long-term client um, and family friend. Great example. You know, Ludicrous craziness being delivered in the middle of a rural field uh, in southwest England. But meticulously planned, all the risks, all the hazards thought through, uh, and, and proper systems put in place 
for risk management and risk mitigation. It doesn't mean we sanitize the gig. It doesn't mean we make it dull and unexciting and predictable, because risk management is the tool whereby we can introduce new and different and challenging things. That's how we can be sure that this stage isn't going to fall onto people, or folks get hit with pyrotechnics, or folks get hit with laser beams or whatever. That's what risk management is all about. It's a facilitating tool. Uh, rather than a dead hand of authority saying you can't do this. Next one, please. So my 10-second summary, I'm not sure how much time I've got left of my seven minutes, is please be positive about this issue of health and safety. Don't see it as an impediment to new, dynamic, and creative events. See it as a f facilitating agency that allows you to achieve a creative vision, allows you to invite the public into your space, with security and comfort that they're going to enjoy their time there and they're going to go home in one piece. Last one, please. I would argue that health and safety is about protection. It's about protection of your staff. It's about protection of your audience. And ultimately, it's about protection of your brand, whether that brand is a commercial entity, a city entity, or indeed a, a, a national identity. You're trying to bring these big cultural things that we've been hearing about this morning and this, uh, this afternoon, uh, if it goes wrong, that has massive implications for your, uh, for your brand, wherever that is positioned. So embrace health and safety. It's a good and positive force. Uh, and the wind is just as strong in Texas as it is in Doha, as it is in any other territory. Gravity is just as strong. So whilst the legislation may not be there, actually the physical drivers to protect staff and to protect the public are identical in any territory on, territory on the planet. So, that's my last word. Please embrace safety as a positive entity. Thank you very much, Tim, and not the least for sticking to the seven minutes. Heinz, would you like to add to that, and then we'll open it to the floor. Thank you. First of all, a secret for you. I have also something in common with Madonna. You had her on stage. I have the same age. So at least that works. Um, I think uh, Tim said a lot about um, safety and health, which gives me the opportunity to talk more on the security part. And um, at the end, you would not believe it that until two and a half years ago, there was no global organization taking care of security and safety in sports. You have WADA for doping, you have many, many other organizations in all the different fields uh, of sports organizations, organization, but nothing was here uh, for sport, safety and security. And therefore the International Center for Sport Security has been founded and we are based in Doha but uh, working globally. I don't know if my presentation works. The format. You look good, though. No, it's not the the full picture. No, it can't. Okay, I think you have to minimize it, please. It's seamless. Hmm? Do we have a chance to bring it back? Okay, hosting major events. Uh, I would like to provoke, of course, uh, because we said people should not uh, fall asleep. And I say the bid winner is sometimes the first loser. Because the winners of uh, bids are immediately in the spotlight. And sometimes, depending on the uh, road they have to go up to the event, they are under fire or along the road. We have some examples. Uh, we had in the past, we were talking already about South Africa, the South African World Cup 2010. It was a three years debate, discussion about crime, mainly crime, uh, lack of 
safety, security standards in this country. And at the end, this event was very successful because security measurements were taken very seriously, but at the end, the event suffered. And instead of 500,000 people uh, traveling to South Africa, it was only 250,000. So uh, it was really an, an issue for this country and the host cities. Uh, we had the example, next please. No, one back please. We had London Olympics. It was a very successful uh, Olympic tournament. And everyone was talking positively, and it was good that this happened. But at the end, uh, terrorism threat was one of the key topics. It was discussed over two years, three years. Is London able to manage such a huge event in the city, in this big, big city? And what also happened was uh, an incident, private security organization failed and security costs increased from 258 million pounds to 533 million pounds. Imagine whatever business you are running, uh, you have double costs, you have to increase your budget uh, within two years time or one year's time uh, by 100 percent what it means for you. So. Obviously, there was something wrong in planning, in assessing uh, these uh, pre uh, preparations. Sochi, uh, 2014, the Olympics, a lot of discussions about security, a lot of discussion about uh, terrorism attacks uh, to be expected, to be prevented of, from, and uh, also in, not really in a positive uh, light uh, these discussions about these games. Next, please. Can we have the next slide, please? Okay, we have heard about Boston, and I think these kind of uh, strategies you will never be able to avoid uh, disasters, strategies uh, forever. That's not possible. But you have to work on this to prevent and uh, to assess and prepare yourself as organizers. Next, please. Well, it doesn't really work. That's a shame, but okay, we will make it. Um, let's go ahead. I think what uh, Tim already explained was the factor of health and safety. So I don't go into this anymore. <laughs> You're making it bigger. <laughs> it's now 175%. <laughs> And again. <laughs> so, what about my seven minutes now? <laughs> you have 50 seconds. Two left. <laughs> Can you talk without the slides? I don't have my script here, so ah. it doesn't really make sense. No, we make it differently. Um, I will. Okay, now it comes. Okay. So, next, scroll it down, please. 
scroll it. <laughs> it's seamless. Okay. Security. What is important to talk about security? Uh, first of all, it's the policing task, which means uh, the, uh, the relation between public police and private security uh, staff that must be very clear from the beginning uh, who is playing which role. Secondly, prevention and detection of crime, terrorist threat and maintenance of public tranquility. And thirdly, in the event of emergency or disaster, what we heard from Tim, uh, security takes over from safety because it's not a safety issue anymore, uh, then it becomes a security issue. Next, please. Not to forget, uh, nowadays, almost daily, we are talking about integrity issues. And integrity means, on one side, match manipulation. Uh, it means, on the other side, corruption. And uh, this is something we have to face uh, really on a daily basis. You can follow the last few weeks. Every single day something happened. And this must be part of planning when we talk about uh, security, safety, and health. At the end, it's kind of mental health which has to be taken into consideration. Next, please. And uh, what do we have to do? We discussed uh, quite intensively during the lunch. Uh, there is lack of standards when we talk about events worldwide. We talk about sporting events, and there is lack of standards, and it needs uh, some kind of basis to start with. It needs a reliable reference document. And therefore, as we, as the ICSS, uh, brought together experts from all over the world from the major events in the last uh, few years, last 20 years, uh, we started to work on such a document. Next slide, please. Which uh, describes standards, which is flexible, uh, which ensures continuous improvement, uh, ensures a dynamic and robust model, uh, optimizes security plans whilst minimizing rework and security costs. Sometimes you face, after uh, several years, that construction work not planned in the right way leads to rework, and this, of course, increases costs or causes costs again. And we have heard a lot of, uh, about legacy today. Legacy for host cities and host na nations start at the very beginning of uh, planning an event. Next, please. And next, please. And what we have created is a so-called SSI model, security, safety, and integrity model, which covers all the phases you need from uh, starting to plan when you, you won a bid for an event. It starts with, or it should start, with due diligence, it goes to planning of strategy, uh, to planning itself, implementation, testing, execution, closeout, and then it leads to legacy. And this has dozens of uh, components uh, within which, uh, to be considered. The next slide, please. For the preparation and the operations phase. And the, this missed so far, we, there was lack of this kind of information, and therefore we are trying to bring it together and to offer it uh, to event organizers worldwide, uh, to governments, uh, all the institutions involved. Next, please. Yes, risk management. Uh, Tim already mentioned this as a very essential part. Uh, risk management is a must for all event organizers. And it starts with uh, a, an appropriate risk assessment. It needs uh, to clarify roles and responsibilities. The stakeholder management is very, very important from the very beginning. It has to lead into crisis management operations, crisis management planning. Uh, and very important, it needs a communication plan. Uh, this has to be prepared long term. Of course, depending on 
the size of the event, of the dimensions, uh, of uh, the importance of events, but these are elements they are must-haves. Next slide, please. And just to give you three examples, I give you examples where I have been involved, so I, I have the insight and we can also uh, discuss uh, some of these uh, examples later. 2006 uh, FIFA World Cup Germany, uh, we started with an overall risk management plan in 2003. I was even responsible for this as the overall program manager and we went through all the organizational areas. Uh, we, were, we were talking with all the managers from the different areas. Uh, we made a full risk map and started with risk mitigation uh, in a positive way, as Tim also said. Positive, think positive, don't take risk as a negative element, so work on this. And uh, at the end, we involved all the stakeholders in the country, private, uh, public uh, authorities, government authorities. Um, we made an incident scenario exercise, uh, including about 120 people, all the managers responsible for the host cities, the venues, uh, bringing together all the headquarter people and running through a two days session uh, with stress programs and uh, incident scenarios. At the end, we were lucky. Uh, we had no major incident uh, during the whole World Cup, but it had also one reason. We started five years before the tournament with a clear philosophy and a very positive uh, approach with a slogan, a time to make friends, bringing people into the country, educating people within the country. Uh, based on this, uh, we also made a similar concept uh, for 2008, for the Euro 2008, uh, with two countries, Austria, Switzerland, with UEFA as the organizer. Again, we tried to bring all stakeholders together, work on this uh, plan, risk management process, a coordinate communication plan. Everyone knew exactly what the other is doing. We had during the tournament daily uh, video conferences, governmental institutions, UEFA, host cities. And so we, it, uh, it was running very smoothly. And we did not have any security uh, issues, some organizational incidents, but nothing security related. Next slide, please. South Africa, we already mentioned this. Uh, of course, also, because some of us, I was also involved again, we took our key learnings, and this is also very important, knowledge transfer from events to other events. Uh, so we could bring the knowledge to South Africa uh, to work with the LOC, within the LOC, and we uh, defined the clear decision-making process between all stakeholders we made crisis management and communication training centrally in the headquarters in all the venues and prepared all our people uh, at this level, which helped a lot. And we had a crisis, we had a security crisis, uh, but we could overcome this. Uh, there were in four stadiums, in four venues, uh, strikes of stewards. They just uh, went off and within two days during the tournament, uh, we had to replace the whole security setup for all the stadium, for these four stadiums, and there was a contingency plan behind. Contingency plan by the South African police, and this was extremely helpful because we could, within two days, train the new staff policemen uh, to take over. And finally, we had a very, very successful event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. I think if I can just quickly summarize, we had two parallel presentations. The message was when you get a big event, you're in the media focus. You need to set a multi-stakeholder agenda. You need to think about emergency preparedness. You need good risk management. You need to be positive, And you need to think protection for guests, for the staff, for the brand, and ultimately for you. And um, Heinz complimented Tim's presentation by giving us examples of things that had been questionable, 
South Africa, the emphasis on crime for three years, London, double the costs in security, and Boston terrorism changing the rules of the game. And finally, what he basically said is, there are systems out there, he has one, which can help event organizers actually put this together in a coherent manner. So that's what you've heard today. What I'd like to hear from the audience is questions for our experts. Yes, please. Thank you. Hi, it's John Coxter-Smith from Sagacity. Thanks very much, all three of you, for, for that. Some, something that struck me probably for the first time, actually, in, in, in listening to you three wax lyrical, was along the lines of the timing of, of your involvement. Because it seems to me, and there's an invitation to respond, perhaps, rather than a direct question here, that since reputation management is so key to the successful delivery of the event, really, governments, cities, whoever, should be consulting with you people before they even think about it. What do you say? Well, certainly from my perspective, uh, as early as possible. Um, Can you speak up, Tim? They could turn it up. Isn't that the wonder of technology? Another 3 dV on the mic. Um, Can you hear? Can you hear? Yeah. Marvellous. Um, it's never too early to start considering risk management plans um, and emergency preparedness. Uh, I, I'm not going to say that every single show, every concert requires someone like me on day one to start directing them. Um, but depending on the scale of the event and the nature of the risk that you may be facing, um, it needs to be one of the earliest considerations. If you're planning a simple theatrical show in, in a fixed venue, a lot of those big considerations are on risks like you know, fire or um, you know, public access and egress uh, will already be covered in the nature of the building and the construction. Um, but when we're talking about these mega-scale projects that have been the, you know, kind of the, the bread and butter of the, uh, the discussions to date, um, then I would say that considerations of risk management and security management need to be there at the very beginning. Uh, and certainly those will be key criteria that the, um, you know, the, the FIFAs and the, um, the, the IOC will be considering uh, when they're judging a city or a country's bid uh, for those kind of uh, global, um, global events. Um, so I, I would suggest that weaving a good safety and security plan into your bid um, is, uh, is a strong thread, or better yet, if I put it the other way around, if you don't weave in a safety and security bid, you haven't got a chance of getting what you're aiming for, let alone when you get to the next phase of, of delivering it in a safe and sustainable manner. Heinz? Right. Just to add, uh, I think we have heard today some of the word master plan already. And um, what is necessary is to have safety, security, integrity. We have to take it also uh, on the agenda. It must be part of the master plan. And when you start to link uh, the different stakeholders uh, with each other, it does not matter at the beginning. You just have to be aware. And I think this is something which uh, has been underestimated in the past. When you see, for example, the, the FIFA list of requirements or IOC, and you go to the security safety chapter, it's normally not more than one and a half or two and a half pages. And compared to the importance uh, or the results you would like to achieve at the end with events, uh, this should be developed, should be changed. Uh, the two of us were a few years ago, four years ago, we had a working meeting in Brazil because we were supposed to, uh, to provide some expertise and services, and they did not want to talk yeah, at the end. Yeah? Uh, they did not want to make decisions, and, and then they suffer. And I did not have Brazil on the map of my examples, but it's really a shame that such uh, good countries at the end are in the spotlight in a negative why, way. Why, why yeah? are they doing this? Are they doing this because they, they don't want to put emphasis on this issue when they're talking 
about the bid? Um, there might be different reasons. This can be national pride, which is understandable and acceptable. Uh, to say, okay, we can do it uh, our, our own way. We don't need experts from abroad. Uh, or we also, I also faced when I came to South Africa, um, and I was talking about we did it in Germany this way. After maybe one year, I had the feeling people do not want to hear these arguments anymore. They want to do it their way, but these kind of events, and I think we are all talking about major events uh, in host cities, host countries, with enormous relevance uh, and importance and media coverage. These kind of events need global experts to be brought together and they can then advise governments because if a government or if a country has not uh, organized a major event how would they know uh, about the requirements and uh, operational requirements they have to fulfill and therefore uh, it, we are talking about global events it needs global packages it needs global uh, expertise. This is a pretty serious statement you're making. You're basically saying that these aspects have to have a global overview that individual countries, all individual countries, some individual countries, you give the impression that the German approach is, and I'm not putting this in a, in a negative way, but is a kind of model that should be taken. Would other countries look upon that and say, that's your way, we think we can do just as well our way? Sure. I think it's very important. I was, uh, I had discussions back in 2005 with uh, South African leadership and uh, the, the chairman of the organizing committee said to me, I would like to have you as CEO or CEO. I said, no, please not. This must be your event. You, not, you must have your people. Your people must, uh, at the end, also leave legacy. We, or I, as an expert, I can support you. Uh, I, can, I can shadow one of the uh, leaders. And in Germany, what Germany did, when I started in 2001, I was the, the first person from a foreign country, even if it's only Austria, but they brought me in because they said, okay, we should not do it only with the Germans. So it must be a good balance and it's very important to have this local culture and flavor because I would not understand, uh, I could not run a, a World Cup in Qatar in the top leading position. So you need a local decision making yes. and local stepping up to the plate against the background of some accepted international norms you're saying the international norms are not strong enough or have not traditionally been strong enough in this area. Tim, you wanted to make a comment and people in the audience, please feel free. There's somebody at the back. Maybe, Tim, we could just take a second comment from the audience, then you can come in. Yeah. Please. <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, Mohammed from Ministry of Education. Now, my question is, uh, what is the role of the technology now and the security? Uh, so we can, we can say that uh, you know that the security now, the development of the technology uh, is helping, did, did, did help in the, in the security, in the security of any event. And can you give us uh, some, some example for that? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I'm afraid I just, uh, with the PI, I couldn't understand your question, sir. I do apologize. It's very hard to, to hear. Could you speak? A little slowly, I apologize, a little slowly, well, you and could state the question just a bit more clearly. Put it's the hard to down. pick it up here. Now, my question is technology, technology and security. What is the role of technology and the security of it? Well, I, th I think te technology is merely a tool. Uh, uh, more important is to have um, a management commitment and a posture uh, to maintaining that security uh, and, and a drive and a desire um, to see it through to the right, uh, to the right end. I don't think there's any technological tool that is a silver bullet for security threats, uh, whether that's RFID chips or X-ray machines at your entry points. Um, I, I think reliance on technology would be inappropriate, although there are some fantastic technological techniques that will allow the organizer to achieve their security objective. Um, but to my mind, the key tool 
is not a technological solution, it's a management solution and a strategy for delivering an appropriate risk management plan and security management plan. So the technology you're saying is a critically important part of a plan, but it's the framing of the plan and the overall management positioning in that plan which is the real driver. I think so, and ultimately human resources are, are going to be, uh, you know, will, will have to be engaged. So uh, if you're equipping your security staff with the, with the latest, uh, I don't know, um, you know, bomb sniffing kit uh, at the front of the venue, um, the, the kit may do a superb job, but actually it's being operated by people who need to be trained, competent, vigilant, uh, and, you know, appropriately positioned. So technology is merely a tool um, that, that can be deployed. It's not, uh, it, it can never be the be all and end all. So you're also saying, if I'm reading into what you're saying, that this just has to have a higher place up the overall agenda. But to, to my mind, I was going to contradict my first comment on, uh, you know, you need to plan for safety and security first thing. Uh, there's a, a, a tried and tested, tested phrase, which is safety first. Well, I'm a safety consultant. I'm a safety professional. I live and breathe it. I suggest it should be safety third. Because first, you need to have a good event concept. You need to have an idea of the thing that you're going to do. That's the first thing you need. The second thing you need, then, is a budget and a wherewithal and a capitalization to achieve that. And then your third consideration is, how do we do that safely and how do we do it securely? So safety first is a great mantra, but actually safety is a little bit further down the agenda. And again, this comes back to the idea of uh, th that events are creative and dynamic and humanly engaging things. That's why they're great. That's why we want them. It's not all about market positioning and brands and capitalization. It's about engaging with your local population. It's engaging with an incoming uh, tourist uh, population to make them feel excited and vibrant. And events need to get hold of you. They need to be visceral. They need to be fun. They need to be exciting. So that's the first port of call. That's where an event organizer needs to start, with something that galvanizes interest and galvanizes the emotion. And then these other considerations of safety and security overlay on top of that. And they are the things that facilitate the delivery that initial creative vision. And if you have to trim budgets, presumably, that should be a ring-fenced area around which you shouldn't do any trimming. Well, clearly, my own invoice is inviolable. Um, I wouldn't imagine anyone would think of trimming that. Uh, things need to be proportionate and appropriate. And certainly in the, the UK, um, there is no legal requirement to factor out all risk. What there is is a legal requirement for a proportionate balance how dangerous is it? How bad could it get? Well, let's put appropriate and commensurate resources in to strike a balance between those two things. So again, I would come back and say, safety third. You know, the first thing is your creative vision. The second thing is your budgeting to achieve that vision. The third consideration then is, how do we do that safely and securely? Um, I fully support, fully support. Uh, coming back to technology, maybe. Um, to one sentence on that, um, I would say yes, it's a tool. It should be used uh, in a way which supports planning. And on the other side, what is very important, uh, you should never use it as a showcase. Uh, also in my experience, especially from 2006, uh, companies coming around and they would like to sell you the best and top and high quality um, and latest technology. And we always said, okay, let's go back to what we are going to want to achieve and uh, what is our objectives. And if we need some elements, we will take it. So we took, uh, we focused on ticketing because this was very important uh, to organize this 100%. And we worked first time on a major event with an RFID chip in the tickets. So we had the data of the uh, of all the, the ticket owners. And this helps, uh, but it has to, to have this overarching objectives first. I fully agree on that. And, uh, Sorry, Tim, a, could I? Okay. There's a gentleman at the back been trying to My get apologies. in on the debate. Well, hello. Um, my name is John Grookstrom. I'm from the Air Sport Federation. I'm just back from a ballooning championship in Japan 
uh, taking part there, about beautiful Japan. And at the briefing, at the beginning of the event, there's a, a, a guy from the electricity company saying, please do not fly into the um, high tension power lines. And we say, of course we won't, we'll kill ourselves. No, he says, it's not that. The metro in Tokyo will stop. So my question is about the third party liability. Um, we can um, get the certification that an event is green. Now, is there some way we can get a certification that the event is reasonably safe or the safety measures have fulfilled some criteria? So we can get a stamp, uh, fulfills the criteria of something, and maybe a lower liability insurance. Thank you. Uh, I, think, I think the short answer to that is yes, no, and maybe. Uh, it depends on your, on your legal jurisdiction. Um, so sometimes there will be a legal framework set in the, in, in the country, in the city, in the state, um, that requires uh, permitting. Um, if we look at, say, for example, the American model, there's an authority having jurisdiction um, and they will need sign off on uh, a relevant competent engineer. Um, the fire department will need to sign off on the plans. The police department will need to sign off on the plans. Uh, medical supply will need to sign off on the plans. So to a certain extent, there's a degree of scrutiny there by those external agencies to say these plans are appropriate. What there isn't, though, is the ability for you as the, or the organizer to be able to say, well, it's no longer my fault. The police have said this is OK. The fire department said this is cool. So I can, I can kind of get on with other things and take my eye off this particular aspect of the event. So whilst there may be approvals, I don't think there will be certification in the sense um, of a cast iron guarantee that things are safe. But Tim, if I, I'm sorry, I don't want to cast you in full flow, but if I understand what Heinz was saying, he's actually trying to create it may not be a formal certification in terms of ISO standards, but it's something which is moving towards that. Is that what you were describing? Uh, that's correct. And we, we are already working on uh, projects, in this case in Qatar, where we are working on infrastructure projects. And this is something uh, which also needs uh, to be considered for the architects worldwide. Uh, they have different ways to approach uh, safety security for sports facilities. Uh, for the event, sport event management and safety security, I think the next step we do is, uh, of course, to further develop this SSI model. And this could be something, a tool for organizers uh, to work with, to be at least sure. I have, uh, I have uh, considered all the uh, the parts of this checklist. I'm on the safe side in planning. And then, of course, it's up to the local authorities. We will never be able to replace uh, the authorities. And this would also be the wrong way, because uh, we cannot step into these areas uh, so deeply. I, th I think a key, a key phrase you brought up there was insurance. Uh, and, and certainly in the UK uh, and in the USA, um, there is significant engagement with, or, with uh, insurance carriers now. Uh, to be able to demonstrate on the part of an organizer a good risk management plan uh, and then the insurers, if they are satisfied that you're doing the right thing, can give you discount on those premiums. If I think back to a concert tour I did back way back in 2006, um, the, the concert promoter, sorry, the tour production saved five times my fee on their insurance premium and I can tell you I wasn't cheap because I actually had two guys on the road for the whole of the tour. Um, but that paid dividends because we were able to demonstrate to the insurance carrier uh, that we had a good risk management plan, that we had the checklists, mm -hmm. that we had engineering certificates, that we got sign-offs in each and every venue, that we discussed in detail with venue and facilities managers our evacuation plan, what seat kills there were, how we were going to duct electricity in and out of the building, etc., etc. So I think that the point you make is a really good one. Uh, and whilst, uh, you know, Heinz has got... Um, a plan very much around the sports agenda. Um, there is literally in the last year or so, uh, as a result of the ghastly picture I showed you earlier on of the Indiana State Fair stage coming over, uh, the USA have now adopted the UK Purple Guide, which is the guide to safety at, uh, at events, which is available free, and I can give you the, the URL now, or you can come and grab me afterwards, which is a 300-page document on how to produce events safely. It doesn't certify anything. 
It's more like the list of difficult questions that you need to ask yourself before you put on a show. The USA have adopted that, and we've now got the beginnings of a global standard for outdoor events that organizers should be moving towards. There's a progressive time consideration in this. I guess over time, you get these norms, people find the good elements about them and begin to impose them. There are certification type approaches that Heinz is looking at, and then over time, you actually get a strengthening of the system. It might not save you your legal fees in the final analysis if something goes wrong, but it reduces the risk dimension. I think that's what we're, we're hearing from here. Um, well, I, I have I probably time for one more question if there is another burning question from the floor. Let's call it an urgent question, not a burning question. <laughs> if there is no burning Especially question, since the fire exit over there is blocked with the tables in front of it, but let's not draw too If there is no burning question, I'm going to give you each one minute to for your final comments, and then I'll bring this session to a close. Tim? Uh, I, I guess my final comments are the same as my initial ones, that health and safety needs to be woven into the very fabric of your plan. It's not the first consideration, but it needs to be right up there amongst the top three. And if you have anything other than a very short-term view of your project, then it isn't lost money on investment. There's no surer way of damaging your brand or putting yourself out of business than by having a major accident. And all of a sudden, your jewel in the crown event actually turns out to be the very thing that draws your city, your brand, your event, your production uh, into global disrepute. And you never come back from that. If I say the words to you, High Cell, Hillsborough, King's Cross, Indiana State Fair, you know, they're all just locations on a map, but they conjure these images of death, disaster, and mayhem. So make sure that your next event is not one of that litany. It's not expensive. It doesn't mean you need to change the entire way you organize yourself. It just means a fresh approach and a proactive approach to managing safety and managing risks. And nobody loses. Everybody goes home. House lights, tail lights, everyone goes back home. Okay. What more do we want from a gig? It's boring, but it's a priority. It's not boring, it's brilliant. I love it. It's not boring for you. <laughs> <laughs> Heinz. Uh, please become our ambassador for tonight. Each of you should talk to three or four people what you have heard here. Because it should not happen that we only talk about safety and security and integrity if something happens. We all don't want these pictures of Boston and Hillsboro and Heisel and so on. Uh, media maybe would like to show it, but uh, I would say all people in, involved in the event uh, management and uh, host cities and host countries environment, we would like to have uh, fun, good games, good matches, good competition, fair, clean, safe, secure. And therefore we have to talk about, and we have to talk about in a, in a positive way. And we know uh, the power of social media, uh, what social media can um, at the end mobilize uh, what we saw in Brazil uh, at the around the Confederations Cup. And the better we are prepared, the more answers we will have. So bring it out of the closet, make it one of your top three priorities, have a good risk management plan, have an emergency preparedness if it all goes wrong plan, and don't be scared to make it one of your top management priorities. That's the message, you're nodding. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for, for this session, and I'd appreciate if you'd thank our excellent panelists in the traditional way. Thank you.